we're in Mark 14. Um, we're picking up with the betrayal and the arrest of Jesus in verse 43. So I'll read from verse 43 and uh, then we'll study. And immediately while he was speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him and lead him away unto God. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. Let's pray. Father, we just pray that as we study this passage, Lord, that you would enable us to understand, to, to see your truth in your word. And Lord, that your truth would change us, that it would transform us as your spirit does his work. Amen. Okay, so we have, uh, in verse 43, we kick off with one of Mark's favorite words, immediately. Um, as I said before, in our, early in our studies in, in Mark's gospel, um, I always prefer the translation, uh, you know, hashtag boom. You know, boom, this happens, boom. It's almost like a cue for a director to move the camera, to cut and to to go to a different camera angle or scene. It, it, what Mark is doing with that word is it's not, he's not always, sometimes he is, but he's not always saying immediately in the sense of uh, this happened like in the next split second, although though it often does mean that. And I think the context here suggests that. Um, but I think what it, more than anything else it means is focus. Here is the point. Here is the focus. So Jesus has been saying, you know, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let's go and see. My betrayer is at hand. So Jesus is saying to them, look, the betrayer is here. And immediately, does it mean immediately? In context, it clearly does. Because he says, while he was still speaking. So that is immediate, isn't it? But what he's saying is, now let look. Here you are, readers. Focus, camera, boom. Let's see what's happening here. This is the scene. And so our attention is drawn to, in, in this shift away. We're there in Gethsemane, we have the whole scene, and then boom, there's now this change. And there's this focus, and we're focusing in on the uh, arrival of the betrayer. So while he's still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now this whole account, by the way, it's funny, but, but um, I think it's one of those accounts which is in all the different, it's in all four Gospels, where there is more variation than there is in most joint accounts. And one of the main reasons for that is because, well as always, the Gospel writers have their own individual focus. But Luke is a physician, so he has an interest in, in the healing of the ear. He's a historian, so he's got a, a focus on lots of the kind of uh, documented facts and details maybe. John, we know, was a friend of the high priest family, so he, he gives us a whole bunch more detail. Mark is somewhat briefer here, and I might make reference here and there to, um, to uh, some of the other gospel accounts for comparison, but really I want to see what Mark is saying to us here. And as, as always, sometimes his omissions say as much as his inclusions. Um, so here they are, and Judas comes out, um, and it says specifically one of the twelve. I don't think that is to remind us who Judas is. I think if we've read through Mark's Gospel to this point, we saw the calling of the twelve, Judas was there, we see mentions of, of the twelve elsewhere, Judas is one of the twelve. Perhaps it is, perhaps I'm wrong, perhaps it's a reminder, but it does seem to me to be something that is really quite striking. This isn't a, an outsider. This isn't someone who followed from a distance. 
Interestingly enough, that we're going to see the contrast at the end of this passage with one who did follow from a distance. And there is, uh, there is Judas here, who's not just one of the, the large group of disciples, but he is one of the key group of 12. He's one of the ones who's traveled with Jesus, has lived with Jesus, has been with Jesus, who has been taught by Jesus for a number of years seems to me um, as if there is something that is being pointed out to us here, which is just the incredible shock that the betrayer is one of the 12 disciples that Jesus himself chose. And one thing we're going to see in all of this account is how God is in control even in the midst of this. God is in control, and Jesus, from the beginning, chose the betrayer to be one of his disciples. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's an amazing thing, practically, when you think about it. You know, as, a, as someone who's a, a preacher and a teacher and has been for decades, um, it is always amazing to me how you can be preaching something again and again and again and again and again, and people just do not get it. It's, it's incredible. I mean, and it's not an intellectual thing. It's not like, oh, I'm, maybe I'm not saying it right. Or maybe it, it's a purely a spiritual thing whereby someone's eyes aren't open and their ears aren't open and they just can't hear what you're saying. You know, I remember um, vividly one time at, at another church having somebody who'd been with us at the church for a period of years preaching. And... It was the first time he preached at the church, first time I'd heard him preach, and he'd been under my ministry and loved my ministry for a number of years. And he got up and he preached, and I just put my head in my hands because it was almost as if, have you heard anything I've said in the last two years? You're promoting stuff that I've been preaching against for years. And it's just, how does, how does that happen? And Judas is just the, the ultimate example of this. But you know, kids can be raised in Christian homes and not be saved. People can go to church for years as part of their tradition and not be saved. If Judas can be a disciple of Jesus for three years, one of the twelve, and not be saved, then anyone can be. God has to open the eyes. And Judas is going to serve his purpose. He's He's not one of the chosen in the sense of believing, but he's certainly one of the chosen in another sense. And uh, Paul in Romans 9 talks about both of those things. But Judas here does have his purpose. And specifically, um, just talking about Judas's purpose, they needed Judas. They had to have him. Um, we, again, this is some of the details from the other Gospels. I don't want to do it too much because I want to stick to Mark. But we, we see here a crowd coming out. And we know from elsewhere that the crowd involved a Roman cohort. A cohort was, um, was a tenth of a legion. There were, I think I'm right in saying there was ten cohorts to a legion. A legion was 6,000. So you've got about 600 soldiers, give or take, approximately. I'm not... No idea if they'd be exact divisions, but about 600 soldiers. And a Roman cohort could not be sent to make an arrest unless somebody appeared before the governor and made a complaint that someone had broken Roman law. A, a crime that was punishable, a, a serious crime. Now the governor didn't even live in Jerusalem. The governor was based in Caesarea, which was the capital of Israel, according to the Romans, who were ruling over the land at the time. But he would come to Jerusalem for major feasts like Passover. So they're taking this opportunity of the feast to be able to have the governor in town to go before him so that this cohort could come out and make this arrest. And that could not happen unless someone on the inside made a complaint that something serious had been done. We're not given the details, but undoubtedly then Rome must have felt that from the basis of what Judas had said, that Jesus was somehow a threat to Rome. And we might see little hints towards that later on in the trial scene. Um, so they needed him for that. And I think the other thing they needed him for was to know where to make the arrest. Where to make the arrest. Um, 
we in Mark only have Gethsemane mentioned here, but in John's Gospel, uh, we're told that they prayed in Gethsemane at other occasions as well. And so Judas knew where to bring them to, as well as being one who was able to make a complaint. So Judas was, was necessary in this whole process. Um, so let's, let's talk then a bit more about the rest of the crowd. So Judas is there. There is this crowd, as I've already said, we know from the other accounts that there's a Roman cohort. We know, uh, that's from John's account, we know from Luke's account that the temple police, the, uh, the, the, the Jewish religious police, as it were, they were there as well. And then equally here, um, we have, pardon me, they have a crowd with, with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now, I, I think this omission is fascinating. We know from the other accounts, the Roman cohorts there, 600 soldiers. We know that they're coming and they're armed and what have you. We know that the uh, Jewish police are there, the religious police are there, and they would be armed as well, and that's mentioned. But they're not named in Mark's account. We're not given those details. Why? Because Mark's focus is on this next phrase, from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. They are the ones responsible. Somebody had to go to the Romans to get them to send the cohort out. But Mark's not focused on that. What Mark is focused on is that the plot as a whole has come from the Jewish leaders. Remember in the earlier chapters, Mark has been dealing with the temple, the theme of the temple, the temple coming to an end, the temple sacrifices coming to an end. That's, that's a theme he's going to continue into the trial. It's a theme he'll continue through to crucifixion as well. So this whole kind of thing of the temple and the religious leaders is very much part of Mark's focus. And that's where he's focusing on here. He's focusing on the, uh, the Jewish leaders, uh, once again, who have been the ones behind this plot. They were the ones who betrayed... Uh, who, sorry, who got Judas to betray Jesus with a bribe of 30 pieces of silver, as we've already mentioned. Now, that leads me into another point here, which is this. The Sanhedrin, the, Jew, the Jewish religious leadership, they had their own police, they had their own trials, they had their own uh, methods of doing stuff. The, the Sanhedrin could have ruled that somebody should be stoned to death according to Mosaic law. But they had no authority to practice that. They couldn't exercise capital punishment because the Romans wouldn't let them. So they have to get the Romans to persecute Jesus. They have to get the Romans to put him to trial. Now Jesus ends up having two trials. He has a trial by the Jewish religious leaders and then they hand him over to the Romans for the Romans to do it because the Romans are the only ones that can, can instigate capital punishment. So with the Jewish leadership, they have their system for doing trials. And like any system, like we have you know, authorities and rulers here in our, in our land, um, there are rules. And the Sanhedrin had hundreds of rules about what you can and can't do at trial. You know, you must watch you know, a, a, some sort of TV police or movie detective thing where some criminal does something but gets off on a technicality. What does that mean? It means there was a rule that was supposed to be kept that wasn't kept. There are all these rules that need to be kept. And originally those rules are in place to protect the innocent. Now, what I'm going to make mention of tonight for the first time, but I will make mention of multiple times in the coming weeks and months, is that there were 22 specific rules that the Sanhedrin had regarding trials that were broken. They broke their own rules again and again and again and again. And if I didn't, I could say it 22 times, but I'd probably bore you, but you get the point, and again and again. And the first of these is simply that no arrest could be made by the religious authorities that was affected by a bribe. So as soon as they hand the money over, as soon as they hand the money, as soon as they promise the money, to Judas, they have broken their own rules. They have invalidated any guilty verdict on Jesus. So why on earth would they do it? Well, referring back to our kind of TV, movie, cop, detective kind of things, 
you will get them doing stuff that's not legit, not, so, not on the books, they do things behind the private, because they want to secure a conviction, because they're sure that the person is guilty, and they take the risk of getting caught on a technicality, because the priority is finding this person guilty. This person cannot get away with it. And that was kind of the attitude of the Sanhedrin, no doubt that they had decided that Jesus was guilty, he had to be dealt with, he had to be removed, and they had this problem, as I said, that they have to somehow have somebody with inside knowledge report him to the Romans so that he can come and be arrested. They have to know where to go for the arrest. They need someone on the inside. And so when Judas comes to them, it is the answer to their prayers. It's exactly what they want. And, and so they take the risk. And I think that when we start on this trail of, um, of violations, it's worth mentioning this. Sin for everyone, believer or unbeliever, is a slippery slope. If there's something that you won't do, I'm not doing that, that's wrong, and you do it, then the next step's easier to do. If you walk a mile, you're now one mile away from the two mile mark. You walk another mile, you're one mile from the three mile mark. You understand? Every step you take further away gets you further to the next step. And that's why uh, sin can be such a slippery slope, that once you've done one thing, you do another. They, they dig themselves in a hole. They create a situation where they've compromised, and then they have to go on compromising, and go on compromising, and go on compromising, because they have to get the result. And I think for churches, there's another lesson here, and that is this. Pragmatism can be a killer. If we decide that the end result is right, the pragmatism that can get us there can compromise us in all sorts of ways. As believers, we need to make sure we walk purely each step of the way and not simply get the result that we want. We need to trust God for the outcome, trust God for the result. But what they did is they decided that they had to get this outcome, and so they compromised more and more and more and more to get what they want. So, there is this, um, there is this violation by bribing Judas that invalidates them straight away. And then there is the second law that they uh, break, there's going to be three of them tonight. The second one is this, and we see it um, in, the next, in this verse here. They come with a uh, crowd with uh, swords and clubs from the chief priests and scribes and elders. And the second rule that they broke here was simply this, that the Sanhedrin, judges as well, but also members of the Sanhedrin, were not allowed to participate in an arrest. If you're going to be one of the ruling body that is going to pass judgment on a person as innocent or guilty, then you can't be involved in arresting them. Because you kind of you need to separate yourself. So like when we know our courts, when the judge comes to see you, you know, he's not the policeman who may have seen you resisting arrest or what have you. He wants to come and he wants to look at the facts impartially. That's his job. So they were banned from being involved in any arresting procedure. Here they are doing the arrest. And the third law that was broken, which we don't see as clearly here, you see more clearly in the other Gospel accounts where mentions of torches and lanterns are, um, but we know already from Mark's account that this happened at midnight by the connection with Passover, but there were no arrests that were related to, uh, no steps of criminal proceedings more accurately, that were allowed to happen after sunset. Couldn't happen after sunset. And there's good reason for that. They don't want anything to be rushed and done and rushed through. And we're going to see similar kind of laws to this later that just are all there to prevent things being rushed in case the wrong judgment is made. And yet they do it. They go out and do it. And why do they do it? I think the reason they did it after sunset was because at the Last Supper, at that Passover meal, when Jesus identifies his betrayer, Judas, he forces his hand. I don't think there were any plans to crucify Jesus at this time. It wasn't their intention. Because as we're going to see, there are numerous rules to prevent them 
from doing what they did at this time. The darkness that after sunset is just the first of many. So why did they? Because Judas has now been ousted from the group. He's been exposed. He's now had to leave. So he goes off to betray him. They have to strike now while they have the opportunity. And so all of these things then come together. So there is then this uh, multitude that come to him, uh, which is kind of interesting if you think about it. I mean, you've got 600 Romans, you've got the Jewish police, you've got the chief priests and elders, and, and uh, well, you know, who knows whatever hangers on. You've got the best part of 1,000 people here, perhaps. Certainly, you know, more than 500 or so. That's a lot of people to turn up to a garden to arrest a single person. And I think it says a lot, but I think there's more to it than that as well, but we'll come to that. So, so verse 44. And what's interesting, actually, is although Judas is named in verse 43, it's interesting that in the previous section, when he was exposed, that, um, that it simply says that... Um, I'm going to just go back to it now. Um, no, I can't see it. But there, there is almost a sense of um, downplaying the betrayal. And Judas is mentioned here by name, and yet afterwards he here is referred to as the betrayer. And look at the verse before. So in verse 42, my betrayer is at hand. At verse 44, now the betrayer. So we've got this little sort of bookends thing here. Betrayer, betrayer, and in the middle is Judas being, uh, being named. And it's, you know, it's, I think he's named, as I said, because the focus, he's one of the 12. But it is interesting in this whole account, the anonymity of other people. And although Judas is named, the fact that he's referred to as the betrayer seems to be part of that motif as well. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. I think what Mark is doing in avoiding the names to some degree is he's focusing on the points. And the point is, yes, Judas betrayed him, but the point is that he's being betrayed. There is a betrayer. It is the handing over that is Mark's main focus. He hasn't really done as much of a character study on Judas as, say, John did. Uh, but... Uh, but he is now referred to simply as the betrayer. The betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man, seize him and lead him away under guard. Now there's, there's several fascinating things here. Okay? We've got this huge crowd, okay? 500 plus people, maybe as many as 1,000, large number of people come. And he's basically saying, I'm going to go in and give him a kiss, and when I give him a kiss, that's your sign, and I want you to come in and seize him and grab him and lead him away. Judas sounds scared to me. Does he not? It seems strange to us that Judas might have some idea of who Jesus is and yet still be prepared to betray him. Je Judas Judas was certainly, at a bare minimum, aware that Jesus had power from on high. Jesus has been there with his 12 disciples. Judas has witnessed him casting out demons. Do you remember we made note of that early on in Mark's Gospel, where he sent them out in pairs. Judas went out in a pair to cast demons out of people because Jesus gave him, Judas, authority to do so. That's shocking. That's shocking to me. Judas knew the power of Jesus to some degree. To what degree, we don't know. Could Judas really have thought that Jesus was possessed by Be Beelzebul, the prince of demons, like the religious leader said? Surely he knew that Judas was of God. I'm ah, sorry, that Jesus was of God. It's such a bizarre thing to me. It's so strange that Judas, he must have known. He's, come on, let's bring a cohort. I'm going to go and identify him so you get the right guy, but then that's it. You've got to seize him and grab him. He's worried about what Jesus, they are all worried about what Jesus might do. And it's interesting that we see that in the context of a kiss. 
the identification is a kiss. Now, we are now familiar in our culture with the expression betrayed with a kiss. Betrayed with a kiss has become a colloquial part of our English language. Um, the idea that someone who is a faithful friend would betray you. No kissing needs to be involved for the expression to, to be relevant. You know, we know what the phrase means. This has become such an in, uh, intrinsic part of our understanding. Now, what we don't know so much is why the kiss. It, um, a kiss was a greeting in those days that's probably more parallel with a handshake today. Kisses were greetings generally, you know. Um, if, 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 you were, if I were to meet somebody at church for the first time, you're not going to catch me kissing them, you know? I mean, it's not what we would do today. But it is what was done in that day. There's a few things specifically with regards to uh, kissing and, uh, that are worth noting. Firstly, it was considered impudent, disrespectful, for a disciple to kiss the rabbi first. So he kisses him and says, Rabbi, in doing that, in approaching him and kissing him first, that's a sign of disrespect. He would have known that, he'd have been aware of that, but at this point, he's going in, he's betraying and he's going out, it's not his great concern. But it would be a, a, um, it would be a sign of disrespect to kiss first. But in general, the, the, the disciple to kiss their rabbi, which would typically be done on the cheek, but maybe the hand was how it was done, it's a sign of discipleship, it's a sign of homage. You're, you're my rabbi. I mean, if you ever watch that classic movie, Fiddler on the Roof, where you see how they treat the rabbi, they'll come and approach the rabbi and you see them kissing his hand. I mean, this, this, was, this was how it was done. And it's a sign of respect to him. And so it's not just that Judas identified him, it's that he took a sign of respect, did it out of place, making it disrespect, and in doing so committed the ultimate disrespect, which was betraying him unto death. Now, I don't see a lot of people referencing this, but I, I've been playing around with this idea in my head, and I think there's something significant here. Because the kiss is such a focus, and obviously it was factually what happened, but there's all sorts of factual details in these accounts that are left out. You know, John tells us some details, Luke tells us other details, Mark tells us least of all, but the kiss seems to be relevant to everybody. And the, the most well-known passage in the Bible about a kiss is a passage that involves kissing the sun. So let's turn to Psalm 2. Psalm 2. <clears throat> Psalm 2 I believe here, and, and let me just say this, because you, know, you guys know I love my references to the Old Testament. Always I'm doing it, and I love it. And one of the things we were talking about on um, the last couple of Tuesdays is how when you, when you reference the Old Testament, that sometimes it's just pointing to the text, and there's the text, and that's what it means, and therefore you now understand how it's being used by the New Testament author. But sometimes there's a change. There's something different. We, we recently, on a Tuesday night, looked at the example of uh, 1 Peter 3, where he references, alludes to uh, Isaiah 8. And in Isaiah 8, he's just saying exactly the same things as Isaiah says in his quotation, and then he shifts, because in Isaiah it says, set apart the Lord, set apart Yahweh, and Peter says, set apart Jesus as Lord. Which is a clear reference to Jesus not being Lord as in boss, but being Lord as in Yahweh, as in God. And what he's saying is, what he's doing is he's taking the Old Testament passage and he's making a change. He's, in, he's showing them that that passage is, is applicable to Jesus Christ because he is God incarnate. Now, here I believe that the psalm is being referenced. It's not being taken out of context, but it's being used. And it's being used ironically. So that's perfectly fine for the New Testament authors to do that, but they have to show that they understand it in context and use that context to create the irony. Do you understand what I'm saying? So we're not going to see them... People will say, oh, the New Testament writers take the Old Testament out of context. No, they don't. They understand it in context, and then they use it in different ways. So with that in mind, let's have a quick look at it. This is... Um, 
we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but I'll read through it because it's a kind of cool psalm. But it's about, it's a second coming kind of psalm. It's, it's Jesus coming back in wrath, you know, coming back and defeating his enemies. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in, in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Well, no prizes for guessing where we are so far, right? We've got the nations all angry and against God. The kings are there saying, well, we are in charge, we're bosses, you know, we, 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 we do what we do, and, and they, they take their counsel together against God. Now, it's going to become clearer this is an end-time scenario, but this is kind of what Daniel was building up to, wasn't it? We've seen in our morning studies that, that Daniel was looking at kings and kingdoms and kings and kingdoms right the way through, and ultimately there will be the king who will have an eternal kingdom that will destroy all other kingdoms. And they are coming against the Lord, that's against Yahweh, capital letters there, and against his anointed, literally his chosen one. Who is his chosen one? His chosen one is his Messiah, referred to in Isaiah 40 by that same term. He is the anointed one, and he is the one that they are opposing. Let us burst their bonds apart and cast their cords away from us. So this is what the rulers want to do. The rulers want to be free from God. That may well be an attitude that you see in the world today. <laughs> that attitude, that heart is there. People don't want God telling them what to do. They want to be free from it. So what happens? He who sits in the heavens laughs. What, what a ridiculous suggestion. That you can be free from God? That God can, who created you, who put breath into you, that you can say to him, no, I'll do it my way, thanks. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. So he sits in the heavens and laughs, and the Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Oh, wow, we're back in Isaiah now, aren't we? Isaiah and Isaiah's vision that Yahweh is there saying, oh, you're against me, oh boy, you're in trouble. My wrath is against you. You have come against me as my enemies. And here's what you need to watch out for. My anointed one, my king. I'm going to put my king on Zion on the holy hill. That's the temple in Zion on earth. What are you going to watch out for? You've got to watch out for the coming Messiah who's going to come and set up his kingdom. Because when he comes and sets up his kingdom and he's there in the temple, that's the vision of Isaiah, that's the vision of Ezekiel, that's the vision of Daniel. When he comes, you're over. That's why you fear. Not me per se directly, but the king, the one who's coming, the anointed one. Right? Um, I will tell of a decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my son, Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. So this is the one that's going to destroy them. The king is also the son. And he says, today I have begotten you. It's tricky because in English we think of the word begotten as being born, but that's not what it means. Only begotten you know, referring to Jesus, doesn't mean that he is born, it means that he is the unique one. It's a parallel to anointed. So it's kind of saying, the God's saying, right, you're my son, and today you're the chosen one. You're the one who's going to be the king. You're the one on the holy hill. You're going to go, and you are going to take these nations, these nations that plot against us, these nations that want to destroy us, these nations that want to be free of us, you are going to go and crush them and they will become your heritage. You will rule and reign over them all. This is the kingdom of Daniel being spoken of here. So he says at the end of that psalm, by the way, this is a psalm, this is a song, guys. Imagine singing this on Sunday at church. I sometimes, you know, I've said this many, many times, normally in reference to the lament psalms, but it applies to this as well. I think sometimes our worship, I don't mean us as a church, I mean broadly as the church as a whole. I think our worship is too limited. I think we limit ourselves to things that immediately appeal to us. Even if it's good theology, you know, there's stuff here 
that it wouldn't hurt for us to sing and be aware of, to remember that Jesus is going to come in wrath and destroy those who would be his enemies. I'm not quite sure what tune you put it to, but there you go. Now therefore, O kings, be wise and be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. In other words, you don't want to be his enemies. Be warned what is coming. His king is coming. You kings are going to be overruled by the other king. And this will be uh, your downfall. And by the way, uh, just in the sense of, of chronology here, I'm seeing, because we've been teaching through this, particularly this morning again as well in Daniel, I'm seeing so many of Daniel's themes here. This chronologically comes before Daniel. So just to say, as Paul gets much of his stuff from Daniel, Daniel in turn is getting his stuff here from this psalm, at least some aspects of it. There will be this king who will come, who will destroy the other kings. So they're, they're told to serve him with fear, to rejoice with trembling. You, that's a lovely phrase, isn't it? Rejoice with trembling. Reminds me of... Uh, what C.S. Lewis says in the Narnia Chronicles about Aslan. Yeah, 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 he's good, but you know, you fear him. I don't remember the exact quote, but you get that kind of idea that he was conveying that Aslan was this lion. He was a good lion, but he was a lion. We rejoice that we serve God. We rejoice that we follow God. We rejoice, I guess in this context, that we're on the right side. But we rejoice with trembling because he's coming in wrath. And then look at the last verse. Kiss the son. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. What do you need to do, kings? You need to come and kiss the son, the king. You need to pay homage before him. You need to come before him and acknowledge him as king. That act of respect, that kiss, that act of respect to show that you are his. Because if you don't, you're on the wrong side and he's going to be angry. And his wrath is quickly kindled. And so the ones who are blessed in this context are the ones who are not opposed to him, but the ones rather who take refuge in him. Now I think that context is all very clear, and I think the psalm, you know, is pretty understandable. Now let's just take that, and let's take that back to Mark. Mark is not saying this is being fulfilled, but I think the reference to a kiss I just can't see how we wouldn't have our minds in Psalm 2. Psalm 2 is a very well-known psalm. We've been very well-known at that time. And it's kissing, specifically kissing the Son. It's the kissing of the Son. And some of the other Gospel accounts make reference to Jesus saying, you, you're coming to betray the Son of Man. And so there's that link that is made in other Gospel accounts to the Son, the, the Son being kissed. I'm not sure Mark makes it too closely, but clearly God in this happening is making that connection. And the context of Psalm 2 is that the mighty King, the Son, the Son of God, is going to come. This is who the disciples wanted. They wanted Jesus to come and set up the kingdom and, and be that, that mighty Messiah. And here is Judas kissing the son. It's a sign of respect to show that you're on the right side. And the irony, and I'm probably preaching a John's Gospel sermon here, because John's big on irony, and in John he makes this a bit clearer. But the irony here is that the act of kissing is doing the opposite of what Psalm 2 is requiring. Psalm 2 is saying you kiss to show respect, to take your refuge, to pick your side. And Judas is using the kissing of the son to take the wrong side, to betray him. There is the warning, all you rulers, all you leaders coming together against. What do you mean coming together? We've got Jewish leaders and Romans who weren't exactly best buddies, all coming together to arrest Jesus. We've got them thinking they're mighty, coming with the 500-plus the strong 
crowd with all their weapons and their clubs and their swords coming to take Jesus. And it's just like, what's God's response? <laughs> Laughs in derision because his wrath will come upon them. The Jewish leaders who Mark is focusing on here are trying to protect their system and their way of life. A few years later, the temple and their system is destroyed forever. There's great irony here. The kissing the sun is the sign of respect to show that you're choosing the right side. And the here, the kissing of the sun, is the choosing of the wrong side, a sign of disrespect by someone who is going to go to the side that will receive the wrath of God. Isn't that crazy? Somehow, Judas was able to do this. We know from other Gospels a few more details of why, but we'll leave that and we'll focus on Mark's story. So, he's agreed to kiss him, uh, and so he comes, he went up to him at once and says, Rabbi, he kisses him, so Hema goes in first, and they do what they're told, they lay hands on him, and they seize him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. It is fascinating to me that we're not told who. Absolutely fascinating. I'll tell you why. Because in John's account, where there's so much more detail, because John, we're told specifically, was friend, his family was friends with the high priest family, so he, he tells us that the name of the high priest servant is Malchus. I mean, he knows them well. He tells us specifically that it was Peter who cut the ear off. And John has got his story of Peter that he's telling. And remember, the very, very last chapter of John, the epilogue, as it were, is the restoration of Peter following his denials of Christ, which is one of the most beautiful passages in the Gospels. And yet we understand that Peter was the primary source of the material in Mark's Gospel. He was the primary source. So it's not like Mark wouldn't have known. I mean, what's going on here? Is Peter saying, yeah, so Mark, there's this kind of incident here where uh, somebody cut the ear off. Oh, I can't remember who. You know, trying to give himself good press. But we're going to see that, that that kind of pulling the wool over Mark's eyes was, was actually impossible. And we'll tell you why in a moment. But, but that seemingly wasn't going on. So if Mark knows that it's Peter, maybe Mark... In not, in not saying it was Peter, he's trying to protect Peter's name. Well, he's not doing a very good job then when he talks about him denying Jesus three times. He's not doing a very good job when he puts in the bit about Jesus rebuking Peter and saying, get behind me, Satan. So it's clearly not to protect Peter's reputation. I think the point here in uh, the, the anonymity of it is that there is a fulfillment going on here. There's a fulfillment going on. And Peter is simply part of the flock. He's one of the sheep that will be scattered. The shepherd's going to be struck and the sheep are going to scatter. And if you have um, somebody standing up as the hero, it detracts from the main point, which is the sheep are going to run off and flee away. And so I think that that's my best understanding, and I'm plucking at straws a little bit, but of why he is not mentioned here. But it's interesting to me, again, that even if, if we accept that, the Mark mentions it at all, really, but one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. It's not as grand as it sounds. There's a positive and a negative in the sense of the person who did this, you know, in that on the one hand, it shows bravery. Peter's already said, you know, I'm, you know I'll die for you, Jesus, you know. I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm going to follow you all the way. And, uh, and clearly, uh, he was willing to a point. We kind of joke about the fact that there are perhaps 600 Roman soldiers there, and uh, he goes for the uh, high priest's servant. 
<laughs> you know, it's kind of joked about as almost he goes for the easy target. And that's probably what he did. But I tell you what, you've got to have some courage. You've got like 600 plus people gathered around you and you're going to pull out a sword and go for someone? That's, that's some bravery. Stupidity, but bravery right there. The sword, by the way, don't, don't picture a big whoosh, swashbuckling sword, you know. The Roman soldiers would have their large swords. This particular sword um, was kind of like a small sword or a large knife, something in that region. It was the sort of thing he could have subtly hidden away under his tunic without anyone seeing, so it wouldn't have been known that he had it. But, uh, but there is that uh, going on, and there is the striking of the ear. Luke tells us, and it's interesting that only Luke tells us, the doctor, that Jesus then heals his ear and reattaches it. But uh, Mark is not doing that. He's not giving us every detail. Luke's the historian. He likes all the facts. Mark is painting a picture. He's given us that immediately. Camera focus. Look at this scene. The betrayer comes in. There's this huge crowd coming in behind. He goes in. He betrays him. He picks the wrong side. And he then is arrested. And there's this little kerfuffle that goes on, but Jesus stops that as he says, have you come out against, uh, as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? So what Jesus is doing in that statement is he's distancing himself from that approach. So the approach of the disciple, we know to be Peter from elsewhere, who takes that swiping of the ear, and by the way, he probably didn't go for the ear. You know Roman soldiers were trained to strike a helmet in the exact spot in the center where the helmet was welded together. So that if they got it just right with enough force, they could not just split the helmet, they could split the skull as well. So he probably missed by about three inches. And then to the side. But that's not Jesus' way. They've come with weapons and Peter's reacted with weapons. And guys, that's what we often do. People come at us with the ways of the world and we instinctively respond with the ways of the world. But Jesus here is showing how we respond to our enemies in his response. He doesn't pull out a sword. I mean, there's a place for wrath, Psalm 2. It's going to come, but this is not the time. Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs? to capture me. Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. I like the reference here to the temple. Again, Mark is focusing on the Jewish leaders. The Jewish leaders are the one who sent the crowd out. The Jewish leaders are behind the plot and the Jewish leaders were there when he was teaching in the temple and they did not arrest him then. And they did not come with... Um, in front of the crowds, presumably worried for the people, but they've now come and they've done it in private, they've done it in darkness, they've done it with a large group of people with swords when Jesus has simply sat and taught in the temple. The problem with escalation is it always goes up. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. You know what they say, we all end, we all end up blind and toothless. That's how it works. And there is Jesus, and he is infuriating them. He's frustrating them. They have hatred for him. They have anger towards him, and they want to kill him. But now the huge chasm is becoming evident. That here he is saying, well, what, what are you crossing me for? I, I've sat in the temple. I've sat there teaching. And now you come with this big mob to arrest me? It's not like Jesus has a track record of killing people with swords, of fighting at night, or anything of that nature. And... Uh, he shows how unnecessary the, uh, the precautions are. And again, it intrigues me, the whole precautions. I wonder if Judas knows a, a little, obviously knows quite a lot, and whether there's a degree of fear there involved that he has warned them of who this man is. Perhaps the Romans thinking, well, this is a messianic movement that could result in the overthrow of Rome, which is presumably what they were worried about. Maybe they're thinking he's got these followers that would kind of all support him. And Jesus is clear, no, no, this isn't how it's going to be. You come, that's not, you don't need to come like this, you could have come, but he says, let the scriptures be fulfilled. I think there is here, in the plural use of scriptures, there is a reference to all of the scriptures concerning the death of Christ that we will be seeing out outworked in these coming uh, 
coming weeks as we go through, we see him on the cross and what have you. I think most closely and specifically, he's already made reference to a scripture just a little bit earlier on when he told them just before they went out that when the shepherd was struck, the sheep will be scattered. And I think that really is the focus of Mark here. This is why he's not naming Peter. This is why he's not going to name, well, another reason, but one of the reasons he doesn't name the guy who's coming next. Because there is just this picture, this scene of this huge mob coming in and all the little sheep just scattering off. They would stand up perhaps to a high priest servant, but here's all the Romans and they all have to go. And they left him and fled. It's interesting. Scriptures fulfilled left him fled. The last scripture we had directly quoted and referenced was the one that the sheep will be scattered. Scriptures fulfilled, left him and fled. Mark told us it would happen, and now Mark has shown us it happening. And so really, one of the, uh, the key points of this whole passage is Mark is showing Jesus is in control right the way through. Although he's being arrested, he is the one who is calm and in control. Judas is concerned. The Romans seem to be concerned. They've got all this crowd. Jesus is in control. And he told them this would happen, and now it has happened. Now, as we finish up, there's one last little thing in the last two verses, which are an interesting little aside. A young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body, and they seized him but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. What a bizarre thing to insert into this passage at the end. A little bit of public nudity, an unknown person, seemingly unrelated to the story. Well, to answer this, the best person to explain it is actually Alfred Hitchcock. Alfred Hitchcock. Alfred Hitchcock, as you know, probably know, was a famous director. And he did his movies and he directed them and there were some very famous and well-known ones. And one of his little um, idiosyncrasies, as you like, of his movies was he liked to be in them. He would make a cameo in all of his movies. And he was famous in them. In fact, if you want a more modern example, some of you might know of the, um, the director M. Night Shyamalan. And he does the same thing. He'll have a little bit part or a passing thing in his movies. In, if you follow the Marvel movies, Stan Lee of Marvel, who isn't the director, but he wrote the comics, he gets a little cameo in each of the Marvel movies. It's like a little, a little thing. Um, and the way it was in those days is that biographers who were writing as a mark of authenticity, would make a little cameo, a little anonymous reference to themselves, showing that they were there and they had familiarity with the situation and what have you. And it's for that reason and that in church history that we are pretty certain that this unnamed man was John Mark, the author of the Gospel. So he was there. And just as a little connection for another piece of evidence, we know from Acts, uh, I didn't write it down, but I think it's Acts chapter 12, that Mark comes from a wealthy family, and the linen that he's wearing here would be a wealthier kind of cloth for him to have than the normal tunic. So that gives us another connection. So this, this young naked guy, this young guy who's come, is clearly Mark. Um, And it's an autobiographical note that he puts in. So he's come and he's following along. He says, and the young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth. So whether he followed him as he was led away, whether he was one following to that point, we don't know. I suspect contextually that after the arrest he's following, and they say, oh look, someone's following. And I think the linen cloth is almost like a a, a shawl, a kind of, a, a, a disguise almost as it were, you know, a way of hiding himself from, from the rest of them. And they see that he's following, and so they seize him, because he's got 600 guards there, so he's not going to get away with it. And so what happens then is he, uh, the linen cloth is grabbed and he runs away naked. Now normally the, there would be undergarments. Normally there'd be undergarments as well. And it seems to imply that perhaps Mark had to rush out to be there on hearing what was happening. He wasn't one of um, the, you know, 
wasn't immediately there and, and, and following on. He perhaps uh, was rushing out to be there and therefore he wasn't prepared, shall we say. So when the, when the linen is pulled away from him, his nudity is exposed, and in that culture, even more so than our own, that would be a, a situation of great shame, and so he runs away and he flees to find something to cover him. I think there's all sorts of connections here, by the way. Uh, firstly, um, perhaps tentatively, an allusion to the nakedness of man and woman in the garden. Um, we have already seen the link to garden, the first Adam in the garden. Why? Because we're in the garden of Gethsemane. We made reference to that last time. And in the garden, what happened? Man and, uh, man and woman, the first man, the first woman, and there in the garden, became away aware of their nakedness, and they hid from God. With the close connection to Gethsemane, I suspect there's an allusion here to the garden, to the original Garden of Eden. And in doing so, if that is the case, it's pointing to the sinfulness of this man. That there he is, fleeing like the rest of them. And that then leads to the broader point, which is, which is this. The broader point is this. The Mark, who is writing this story, he doesn't name Peter, he takes a step back. He shows us the action of the scene. And he's showing us, Jesus said, when the shepherd is struck, the sheep will be scattered. Here comes the betrayer, here comes the arrest, the shepherd's being struck, and now whoosh, the sheep are being scattered. And Mark puts up his hand and says, and I was one of them. If we say that we'd have done any different, we simply have the bravado and pride of Peter. We stand with hindsight, knowing the coming cross, knowing the purpose of the cross. And Mark identifies himself with those who ran away. But what happens in the end? What happens in the end is that they were prepared to go to their death for Christ. They did ultimately see the cross. They were prepared to suffer. They were prepared to die. But Mark associates himself with them now and says, we all left him and we all fled. And so, as the curtain closes, as it were, on this scene, we have a scene of despair, of fleeing, of going away. And as the curtain opens again for the next scene, in verse 53, they led Jesus to the high priest. And we have Jesus having his first trial, his trial before the Jewish leaders and we're going to see all sorts of other laws being broken and the situation of uh, isolation and despair that Mark has painted continues on. So we'll pick up there next time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you that, uh, that Mark is honest. I, br I fled too. Father, we've left you, we've deserted you, we've run away in the face of danger numerous times. Forgive us. We didn't fear the sun. We ran away and feared the enemy. May we kiss the sun. May we pay homage. May we take refuge in him. May our trust be in him. May he be the one whom we fear, whom we dread, and not the enemies around us. May we trust you in all things and in all circumstances for your glory. Amen.